Well, good morning. Uh, as you may have heard earlier, Pastor Tom and Lisa are away celebrating 25 years of marriage, which is awesome. That is uh, such a privilege to watch a couple that I respect so much um, and the health that they've got in their marriage and their family. Um, what a privilege to have them around. Um, something awesome happened yesterday for many of the people in this room, or a few of the people in this room. Do we have any seniors in the room? High school seniors graduating or graduated. A couple? I see you, Tonio. All right. Who's that back there? I can't even tell. Yell your name. Haley. Good job, Haley. Oh, Haley Nash, you're back there. All right. Good job, Haley. Uh, I got to witness a lot of that, and many of you may have been there at uh, Little John Coliseum. It was so cool to see all the network of people that I recognized from here that I saw there. Um, you out in your regular day job life, teachers and administrators and um, people just, just there supporting students, and such a, such a cool uh, opportunity to witness yesterday. So proud of you graduates. Um, because the students are now pretty much done with school, right? I mean, you have a few more days, but videos, stuff like that. Now, you guys have some exams left from what I've heard, but because you guys are almost done and because you as professors and teachers are kind of winding down, uh, I don't want you guys to get lazy. I don't think you would, but I don't want your brains to become kind of dull, you know? Um, so I want to keep them sharp. So we're going to do some trivia this morning. And, uh, yeah, we're going to do some trivia this morning. And we're going to start with some easy ones. And you, you might see a theme up here. All right, so this is what's said when I reach your side of the checkerboard. Nope, wrong one. King me, there you go. Some of you guys advanced beyond checkers, I see. You may have seen this musical, The Blank and I. Nice, all right. Not the remake, it's terrible. The original. Literature, literature world. Um, this is the person who used to sit at the round table with the knights. King Arthur, awesome. All right, entertainer with the nickname King. Elvis, good, there's a couple of them. Michael Jackson, King of Pop, good, what else? LeBron James, anybody have feelings about LeBron James in the room? No? No? He did get beat, didn't he? Yeah. All right, so we're not totally indifferent about that. We've got an opinion about LeBron James, okay. This one might be the toughest one so far. This is a saying, heavy is the head that, oh, where's the crown? Good job, good job. All right, well, you guys are sharp. You've proven yourselves this morning, and uh, I see you're up for the summer. Good. Uh, here's the deal. This trivia list and a lot of other things in our culture show me that we're pretty intrigued by kings. And I know myself, I love a good king story. I love to watch movies with kings. I love to, to watch LeBron James play, even though he's not a technical king. He's dominant. I, we love kings. We're intrigued by them. We like their courts. We like what they do. We like when they're great. We love when they're terrible. There's all kinds of stuff that we just are intrigued by when it comes to kings, which I find strange because we've never had one. So we're one of the few nations in the world who for quite some time now have not had a king. And so we watch other nations sometimes, and many of them are kind of doing away with the king thing, but some of them still have them. And we watch other nations, and we see these kings, and we're like, oh, that's, that's curious. That's cool but we don't have one. Well, there was another nation in, uh, in history that had a similar view of kings. They hadn't had one, and yet when they looked around, they saw kings, and they were intrigued by kings, and what happened? And this group of people was the Israelites, and uh, they themselves were also intrigued by them. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to find out what happens in the Israelite nation when they want a king, when they get a king, when they have a string of kings, and then what happens to that whole line of kings. And we're uh, very indebted to a North Point Church series for this for some of our content. They did it well. So we pick up with Israel after them not having a king for quite some time, or ever actually, and uh, they weren't left alone without leadership. They had judges who were appointed to take care of like disputes and legal matters. They had priests who were there to help them kind of come before God and worship him, and then they had prophets, and these prophets would come and deliver the word of the Lord to the people again and again and again. But when the people looked around and they saw other nations and they saw what these nations had to offer with their big bad kings who would lead them into war and who would be kind of a figurehead for them. And then when they saw some of the corrupt, corruption in their judges and their priests, they, they seemed to think, you know what, if they're going to be corrupt, they might as well be know, know how to fight, right? And they might as well help us make us look like other nations, so we kind of want a king. And so this is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 8. They go to Samuel, who's the high priest at the time, and the people say, look, we want a king, go ask God for a king for us. Samuel goes and he says to God, he says, okay, the, the people want a king. What should I do? 
And God eventually grants the request that the people have for a king, but he does so with a very disturbing warning. And it goes something like this. How many of you guys have ever been in your home and another family is over? Don't point fingers. And their young boy does something really dumb, right? And so this young boy is running around and he does something and usually the mother will say, yeah, but you know, boys will be boys, you know? Yeah, he just wrecked your china cabinet, but boys will be boys. Yeah, he threw a baseball through your window, but boys will be boys. That TV wasn't that expensive because boys will be boys. And God seems to give them this really disturbing warning about kings, and it's a little bit more grown up than that. He says, you know, essentially, boys will be boys and kings will be kings. And you're not going to like it very much. In fact, kings, they will enact their rights. Because a king has very extensive rights. In fact, the king basically owns everything, and you're borrowing it. The king owns your field, he owns your fruit, he owns your family. And there's going to come a time where he's going to want all of it. And he's going to ask your sons to fight wars for him, and he's going to ask your daughters to live in his palace, and he's going to ask for your taxes, and you're not going to love it when a king is a king. Well, the people hear this response, and, and they're undeterred. They want a king still. Keep in mind, this whole time, there was never supposed to be a human king. See, God was their king. God was supposed to be their king. So Samuel says all this to the people, and the people say, eh, we still want one. He goes, that's not verbatim, by the way. The Bible doesn't say it that way. But He goes to them, and he finds the king that God has chosen out for them. And it reads like a terrible, terrible episode of a list of dating. Now, flex with me a little bit. This isn't straight out of the Bible. This is my take on it. But ladies, I'm talking to you right now. Some of you haven't dated in a long time, and that's probably okay. Some of you are dating right now. More power to you. Some of you aren't allowed to date. Um, I just had a daughter seven weeks ago, and she is not allowed to date for a long time. <laughs> and I know how that works. I know all the dads in the room are chuckling because that's not how it works. But I'm telling you, I get it now, okay? I get it. She's not going to date for a long time. Well, I've watched and observed, and women, you'll give me some patience, hopefully, with this, because I've never been one, and I don't know what it's like to make these decisions, but I see you kind of sizing these guys up as dating material, and you seem to have so much grace, like a lot of grace, which, thank the Lord, Anna did, because she likes me. But there's this line of kings that happens to the Israelites, and they seem to be kind of dating these kings one at a time, and so along com comes this tall, dark, and handsome guy. And he has everything they've been looking for. He's strong, he's powerful, he's smart, he's well-spoken. Man, he seems like it. But there's this, like, wire loose, right? <laughs> he's got all this stuff going for him, but he's kind of crazy. And that's Saul, right? Their first king. And like dating, usually, you look for the opposite of that the next time. And you find exactly what you're looking for. He's not quite as tall, he's boyishly handsome, He's great with words, and he's romantic, and he plays the strings, right? Right? Plays guitar a little, well, it's harp, but. And yet there's this, like, thing that you just can't fix in him. It's, it's emotional world is like this, and it leads him to the heights, and it leads him to the depths, and oh, this is David. And then along comes the intellectual, and he's neither the first nor the second. This guy you love to go coffee with, right? And he will lead you down rabbit trails of thought that are just inspiring, yeah? And he's stable. He's not the roller coaster emotionally. And yet, he also can't focus on just one girl, <laughs> right? Like, one, two, seven hundred. <laughs> and so this guy isn't it. And then along comes another guy, and this guy is different still, and he's got so many good ideas, and he wants you to pay for them. And he's the guy that always needs gas money, and he's going to start a new company, and he's going to go back to school, and this is Rehoboam, and he will build so many monuments and buildings and tax the people for all their worth, and this dating thing with the kings is not working out because God has already warned them. You're not going to like it when a king is a king. You may think you do, but it's not what was intended. I'm supposed to be your king, not them. People were never meant to be in charge of all of this. So we skip ahead a few kings. It's around 600 B.C. And Babylon is a superpower. And I will not draw you a map because it will be the worst. But Babylon's somewhere over there, okay? And they have a king. People are kind of jealous of him. He's a big deal. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. I will also spare you from that spelling. 
Nebuchadnezzar. He's the big shot, and he's a superpower. And for you to understand how much of a superpower he is, how many of you guys have collections of any kind? Coins, stamps, cool. Yu-Gi-Oh cards, right? Pokemon. And I'm just talking about me. I don't know what you guys do, but... um, (laughs) Baseball cards, some of you collect reptiles, which my wife finds disgusting, so I can't have any. This guy had a living collection of people. This guy had an entire building dedicated to the kings he had conquered. Yeah, he's that in charge. He is so incredible at warfare, his empire is so vast that he parades the kings he's beaten around in front of you just to remind you that he can do this. He's got a king collection. How crazy is that? So Nebuchadnezzar, the big crown, he comes along and he's got this rival to the west, Egypt. Egypt is over here and they've been going back and forth for a while and around about the 600 BC era, Babylon comes over and they just take care of business. Nebuchadnezzar just stomps Egypt. And along the way, They cross through, whoop, that's a U. They cross through a place called Judah. This is where the Israelites are living. And the king, who is at the time on the throne, is overthrown by Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar. And that king is taken to the king collection. He's put on his own shelf. He's got his own spot there. In his place, Nebuchadnezzar, on his way back, installs this new king, Zedekiah. This new king, Zedekiah, is 21 years old. And keep that in mind. Log that away. This may be part of the issue with Zedekiah. He is 21 years old, and he is placed on this throne with basically one role. Don't screw this up. Nebuchadnezzar says, look, you're on this throne. Remember what I did to the last guy. I want you to do three things. Don't build an army, don't build a wall, and pay me taxes. If you do those things, we're cool. But you're a puppet, and everybody knows it. See, this guy is kind of a joke to everybody because everyone knows that he's there just to fill a spot. That's not really the throne he's on. He's just kind of keeping it warm. This is how in charge of Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar really was. This guy's name, Zedekiah, is actually not his real name. It used to be Madaniah. And from my time in Pennsylvania, I think Madaniah is Amish. I think that's where it comes from. And I'm actually intrigued by it, and I think you guys should start calling me that. So call me Madaniah, if you will. No, Madaniah actually meant gift of God. And this 21-year-old kid thought he was a gift from God. Zedekiah comes along, much like the guy did to you in middle school, and says, I don't care what your mom and dad called you. I don't care what your name used to be. you got a nickname now, and he owns you. Hopefully this doesn't bring back painful memories for you. He owns you now. He's so in charge of Zedekiah that he changes his name. His name is now Zedekiah, and just to remind him of how powerful he is, Nebuchadnezzar is in complete control of even his name. Now here's the thing. Along these lines, at this point in time comes Jeremiah, and he is one of the prophets we spoke about before. He speaks on behalf of God. Jeremiah comes to Zedekiah, and he says, look, all the cards on the table, everybody knows you're a joke, right? Everybody knows it. It's it's okay. We know where you're at, but here's the deal. God does not think you're a joke. In fact, God wants to use you powerfully. Let let Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians do their thing. God's allowing them to be who they are. But here's what I want you to do, Zedekiah. I want you to sit on this throne, and I want you to lead the people back to the real king, which is me. I want your throne to point to my throne. I want them to surrender to me, to turn back to me, to stop being stiff-necked, and to humble themselves before me. That's your job. Can you do it? Jeremiah delivers this message. It's actually a really cool opportunity. Only 21-year-old Zedekiah doesn't see it that way. Because kings have this tendency. And for whatever reason, he decides he's not really that interested in God's plan for him. In fact, he's not really interested in paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar or humbling himself to this guy. He's got his own desires. He's got his own plan. And he's going to do what he's going to do. He turns his nose up at the guy who just stomped Egypt and took away the former king. You find some of this story in 2 Chronicles. It says this, He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, his God, and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke the word of the Lord. Interesting, or interesting order here. He didn't humble himself to the God through Jeremiah, and he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. 
who had made him take an oath in God's name, he became stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to God, the God of Israel. I think we can all agree that's a poor choice, right? Bad, bad decision here. And as Nebuchadnezzar starts to find out the ripples back to him, he's not getting tribute, he's not getting respect, he is none too pleased. He's actually pretty annoyed because this gnat of a king that he just put on the throne is buzzing around his head, causing problems. So he sends a few troops to lay siege to Judah. If you guys know anything about siege, which I did not know until recently, it is a terrible thing. Um, I've never been through it, I'm glad, but it is an awful thing to go through from what I've read. Bad things happen when you cut off a city's food and water and trade supply, right? You can start to imagine. Well, this happens for a while. And like most of us, when Zedekiah looks over the walls, he sees the consequences of his decisions, and he all of a sudden remembers the guy that tried to warn him about this, right? Funny thing about us when we do that, right? So he goes back to Jeremiah, and he says, look, guy, um, remember when you told me not to do everything I just did? What do I do now? And Jeremiah says, okay, let's review. You're on the throne. You have one task, just one. Go outside, kneel to Nebuchadnezzar, his army. Submit yourself to him. In so doing, submit yourself to God. And you, your family, and the people, you'll be okay. Just submit yourself. Stop playing this game. It's not your crown. Put it down. Go submit yourself, and you'll be okay. Around this time, a really funny thing happens. Um, Zedekiah and all the people start mumbling because they see all of a sudden that the troops are leaving. So the siege seems to be like it's breaking. And Zedekiah, who has no idea what's going on, pretends like he does and says, See, Jeremiah, I told you. I told you I was the man right now. I've got the throne. I've got the crown. I'm in charge. They're leaving. It's over. Go away. Jeremiah says, No, it's, it's not like that. In fact, Jeremiah records some of his conversation with Zedekiah, and it's almost funny, except it's super scary. He says, listen, Zedekiah, if every single soldier had an injury, they would still beat you. Yeah, that's how bad it is. If every single soldier was injured, they would still beat you. Because you know why? God's already spoken. They're not going to be gone for long. Well, it turns out that Egypt had taken this opportunity while Babylon was focused on Zedekiah and Judah to try to flank Babylon. Now, Zedekiah thinks this is loyalty from these people since he had switched sides. It's not. They just want their shot. So they take their shot at Babylon. He pulls the troops back. They meet him, and again, Nebuchadnezzar stomps the Egyptians. Now, when you're this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, and you destroyed this person and put this person in place, and all of a sudden this guy, who needs to know his role, starts annoying you to the point where someone else attacks you again and causes considerable damage, do you think he's going to be a little frustrated with Zedekiah? Right? The, the boss comes back this time. It's not his troops anymore. It's Nebuchadnezzar in the flesh with a whole lot more power. And it gets nuts. Here's what happens. Two straight years of siege. Now, they could have come in and just crushed him. There's something very intentional about this message he's sending Zedekiah. He's going to encamp around Judah for two years and cause the most ridiculous heartache and frustration and death and pain he can because he's sending a message this time. You didn't want to listen to me? You didn't want to humble yourself? Fine. Deal with this for two years and explain it to your people. Zedekiah, again, after after all of this time, has this opportunity to submit himself, and yet he gets really tired of hearing Jeremiah scream because Jeremiah, from now on, instead of just being counsel to the king, he starts running around yelling. He will tell anybody who will listen, listen, if you want to know why you're in this spot, talk to your king. If you want to know why the troops are out there for two straight years, talk to your king. He knows what he's supposed to do, and he won't do it. Zedekiah throws him in a pit. This goes on for a little while longer, and Zedekiah says, oh, man. Where was that one guy who told me not to do all these things? And he goes and finds Jeremiah, and he says, Jeremiah, listen, what am I supposed to do? What does God want from me? Jeremiah says, wow, okay. One last time, here it is. Take off the crown. Get off the throne. This is not your seat. Submit yourself, and there might be a hope for you. Try to imagine this moment right here. I I don't know exactly how it went. I I have questions about what was going on with Zedekiah, but I imagine him in his throne room. 
And he's sitting on this throne that he knows he's not big enough for. And he's got this crown on that he knows is not really his. It's too heavy for him. He's got people outside the walls. He's got people inside the walls. He's got a string of terrible decisions. He's got the word of God right in front of him through Jeremiah. There is one way out of this place. And yet he's wrestling with this tension. I didn't ever want to get to this point. I had my own plans. I never tried to be and never wanted to be this kind of man. I didn't want to cause all this heartache to the people, but I can't look them in the eye. This did not go down how I expected. Am I really ready to give this all up? This is probably the loneliest moment of his life. This is the moment in his life where I want to come into that throne room in history and I want to kind of creep Zedekiah out and have him say, who are you? And I want to go up to him and I want to shake him and I want to say, Zedekiah, come on, man. You know better. If you don't, let me tell you I've been here. In fact, I've never had all this. I mean, this is a bigger deal than I've ever dealt with, so I don't envy you. But Zedekiah, come on. You don't want this pain. You see one option, that's it, take it. Take that road. Really, save yourself, save the people, save me the heartache of watching this. I want to shake this guy. I want to stop him in his tracks. I want to help him do the right thing because this makes me knot up in my stomach. On a far less dramatic scale than siege and warfare, I think I have been here a number of times. And with all respect to you, I wonder if you've ever been there yourself. I want to tell Zedekiah, stand up, walk out those gates. Don't look at anyone. I don't care if you look him in the eye. Just go. Take things into your own hands and face up to the consequences you have earned now. Because you know what? If you don't, they're going to find you on someone else's terms. He's at a crossroads, a very distinct crossroads in his life where he can choose to listen to the repeated warnings of God through the prophet, where he can listen to the wise counsel he's been given, where he can take another opportunity to avoid some of the stuff he's caused himself, or he can continue on stiff-necked. Come what may, reap the consequences, and be king. I know this feeling. I would guess you know this feeling. When you get to that point where you realize that kings will be kings, and kings want it their way, and so do I. Zedekiah makes his choice. From his throne room, the adrenaline hits, and he runs. Not out to the plain to meet Nebuchadnezzar and submit to him. He runs out the back and says out a garden, and uh, it's a secret entrance. And I put the two and two together, and it's the secret garden. The stories all connect. It's great. <laughs> Makes so much sense in that movie now. No, it's not that secret garden, but he, he escapes out the back of the, of the kingdom and he runs and predictably, he can't run fast enough. And instead of meeting Nebuchadnezzar out in the front of the, of the castle, out in the front of the kingdom on his terms, he goes the long way and Nebuchadnezzar meets him around back on the plains and he captures Zedekiah and it's morbid, but I need you to hear this. Nebuchadnezzar kills everyone that Zedekiah loves right in front of his eyes. And it's the last thing he sees before his own eyes are taken out. And he, he meets those consequences full on. And he's taken off to his shelf in the king collection. And the tragedy here is so deep. When he gets up and bolts, if this was a movie theater and you were watching him on the screen, every one of you would yell at him. You've got to be kidding me, Zedekiah. Really? After all of that, really, this opportunity, you're going to do it again. You're going to be the one making this boneheaded play for the thousandth time. You know what's out there, dude. It didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to go down like this. If there was a shot, the Zedekiah could just stop. Think about the, the throne he'd been given and how it was borrowed. Think about the crown he was wearing and how it wasn't meant for him. Think about the guidance he'd been given. What could have been avoided here? What could God have done in that place with those people, with him? How would history have remembered him? 
how would his own life have been? But he wrestles. See, here in that lonely moment, Zedekiah is wrestling and he's saying this. But I am the king. See? See? I am the king. I am in charge. I am the man. This is my life. This is my decision. I'm going to have it my way. And you know what? Consequences, the ones you're nagging me about, fine. You know what? My decision, my way, my consequences, I'll deal with them. I'll deal with them. You don't have to worry about it. Forget about it. Leave. Get out of here. I'll deal with my own consequences. I'll pay the price. It's mine. Except in that moment, he's got to know what I've found out, and that is that it's not really my life only. It's not really my decision because I'm not actually that in control. And I know better about consequences. I never fully own consequences. They always spill out into your life and my family's life and the communities around me's life. I'm not isolated in my own world. And I was never meant to be king. The truth comes out when the secret slips, the affair is revealed, the thought life catches up to us, the gossip eats away at our relationship, the unforgiveness takes over and digs a root of bitterness, the guilt affects your interactions in your home, the unwise financial decisions build up and build up. The dual life becomes hard to figure out which one you're supposed to be at any given point, and the lies start to chase each other around. And eventually, not only does the act have consequences, now we're trying to keep track of the consequences that have borne their own consequences that we're managing. Maybe the thing that sticks out to me the most about this story is not how boneheaded people can be, and Zedekiah was. Because that's us, right? That's, that's people. This is what gets me. After God was rejected by the people for a human king, and after all the human kings had made their terrible decisions, and after Zedekiah had made bad decision after bad decision, God was there every time. Prophet after prophet after prophet after word after warning after opportunity, after crossroads, after crossroads, God was there. In that loneliest of moments, I don't know how it works, but I've got to believe God was there with Zedekiah. In the worst place I've ever found myself, I've got to believe God was there with me. In fact, the Bible seems to paint a picture of God and his interaction with us. It says that he took the first move. He preempted all of the dumb stuff that was going to take place. Romans 5 says this, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In this throne room, in the midst of our rebellion, in the midst of the worst decision we've ever made, in the midst of the time we're clinging so tightly to the crown and we will not let go of it, and we want it our way, God was there doing whatever it took to save us from ourselves. He sent his son to die in our place. He sends the Holy Spirit to bring conviction on our lives. He sends someone into your life and my life to ask me how I'm doing and to set a godly example. He allows me to escape ten times what I owed. He shields your family for a while. He's so patient to win you and I back. Unfortunately, as Zedekiah found out, there comes a time in the system of consequences where my rebellion dictates my level of pain and eventually the road kind of ends. And some of us find ourselves maybe this morning at a point where you're at a crossroads that feels a little bit different. Because up until now, you've done this or that and you've had the crown and you've done it your way and you've kind of fishtailed on the road when the consequences hit. And you've been thrown off track a little bit and, and yet this time feels a little different. This time it feels like if they are all to hit at the same time, your life would never be the same again. See, it's not random. It's not the fate catching up to you. 
C.S. Lewis says it this way. You will certainly carry out God's purpose however you act. But it makes a difference to you whether you serve like John or like Judas. The same choice that Zedekiah had before him is the same choice you and I have. Do I ignore God's call on my life originally? Do I ignore time after time after time after time of warning and have it my way and reap the consequences that I want to reap? Or do I take heed of his constant grace and his constant warning and allow him to come alongside me and help me manage the life that he's supposed to lead me in anyways? See, Zedekiah could have come out and meet the consequences. Could have walked hand in hand with God and allowed God to manage them with him. With all of his promise and all of his power, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't really in charge. God was. Instead, he chose to run. And they caught up with him anyways. And honestly, this annoys me so badly. See, I hate that. But it's not just this isolated story. It's actually all throughout the Bible. We go to Numbers and it says, be sure your sin will find you out. Galatians 6, 7, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. And I'm like, why? I don't like that. Why does it have to be like that? Your God, change it. Let me get away with stuff, right? Am I alone here? Anybody else just want to get away with stuff? I do. Yeah, thank you. Why do you have this system like this, God? Why has it got to be like this? Proverbs 3. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Hebrews 12. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as a child. Why? Because I love you. Why? Because you're a parent. You get it. You love your kid. You won't let them get what they want. Not all the time. Why? Because I'd rather have you hurt a little bit now than really get what you have coming. Why? Because I was there, remember? And I was there before that, remember? And I kept trying to say it, and here I am again saying, don't do that. Why? Because I love you. I accept you as a son or daughter. I want the best for you. Consequences find us because that's how it works. That's how it works for your kids. That's how it works for you. That's how it works for me. Because God loves us. He loves us so much that he's present in our pain that we've caused ourselves. He's there warning us again. He's there taking us by the shoulder at each crossroad saying, look, here, here you've got two roads. You don't want to go down here. Kings will be kings. If you choose that path, if you choose that throne, if you choose that crown, you're not going to like what happens. You're going to be like Judas or you're going to be like John. Imagine with me the relief that could have come to Zedekiah had he just walked out those gates, said, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, my bad. My bad. He's got God's promise in his heart. He knows that God has promised to to redeem him. He's promised to rescue him. It's not going to be great. He's going to have to face some stuff. But he could have just said, my bad. Imagine the relief when you go and you have that conversation. And it's not fun. Man, it hurts. But it's on your terms. And you're surprising them instead of someone else. And you can just say, my bad. And God is there. It didn't have to be like that for him. And the same invitation he had is the same invitation you and I have from a loving, grace-filled God. A God who says you don't have to manage your consequences alone. You don't have to deal with this by yourself. You don't have to try to wear this heavy crown. It wasn't meant for you. Step off the throne. Let the rightful king take his place and see what God can do in our lives. Can you pray with me? God, thank you for preserving the story of these kings that we can learn from. 
God, I thank you that the principles hold true today that held true then. And more than that, God, I thank you that you are the same God now as you were then. God, that you love us so much, you are so full of grace that you preempted all of this stuff. You saw us in our darkest, deepest place of rebellion. You saw the pain we were earning ourselves and you stepped between those two things. And you offer us that shot. God, I thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice. God, I ask in this room this morning that your present would be, or your spirit would be present with us. God, we need a lot of boldness. We need a lot of courage to face that thing that pops in our head right now. God, I pray you would give us the wisdom to, to deal with this stuff, to come to terms with these consequences that we're earning ourselves by coming to you first and asking you for your help. God, I ask that you would continue to make this community a family, a safe place for people to deal with the mess a safe place for us to come to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and say, I need help. God, I pray that something would be said about this community that is precious, that you're in charge. That it's not our will, it's not our way, it's not our style, it's you. God, we acknowledge you right now as Lord and King, not just friend, not just Savior, but rightful ruler of our kingdom. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.